in. Greetings. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio and podcast on a glorious day. Today is going to be the earliest in the year I can ever recall that it's hit 70 degrees here in the great state of Iowa. Uh, I had the windows open all day yesterday. Maybe a bit of a brief winter, wintry return, middle week, but uh, looking ahead, man, it looks like we might be out of the woods here, except for some, you know, freak snow that we typically get, uh, you know, the, in, in the spring here in uh, the Midwest or the uh, the lower north, if you prefer. Uh, Steve Dace here with Aaron McIntyre and Todd Erzin. Todd is back. How did it go at the SEC Track and Field Championships this weekend with your daughter, buddy? Arkansas uh, is once again the SEC champions, and Ainsley qualified uh, for finals, got through prelims. She qualified as the top time out of everybody uh, there, but the 800 is kind of uh, roller derby, and her foot got clipped in, in the finals, and she tripped. She didn't fall, but you can't recover your momentum after that, so hey, but... That's, that's racing. So it was a good weekend. Fantastic weekend. And she qualified for nationals, you said? And she, well, and she had already done that. If okay. you're in the top, she's amongst the top 16, 800 times in the entire nation, and she already was, and that didn't change after the weekend. So, yes, she's going to nationals in two weeks. Not, not bad. Not bad. That is not bad. Not bad at all. So, congrats to the Arizona and family for that. A uh, couple of uh, uh, housekeeping items I want to make you aware of uh, before we get the show started. But first, a reminder, uh, the Steve Day Show brought to you by our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company, and Aaron reminded me as I came in this morning. He's actually loves this coffee so much he's spending his own money out of pocket on it now. That's how much he absolutely thinks this is fantastic coffee. Shipped within days of being roasted. The roast date is on each bag. There's a flavor for every freedom-loving American, and it's not just a company that makes great coffee. Uh, They also share your values as well. You can use the code DACE at firstcup.com. Firstcup.com, code DACE for 10% off your order. And if you subscribe, you can save an additional 10% off for the life of your subscription At firstcup.com, use the code DACE. I want to remind you, a week from tomorrow, I guess we'll now call it the Christian Nationalist Children's Book. It, this is, it was only a matter of time before this occurred. That, that's, you weren't here on Friday, Todd, when we talked about it. But I know a lot of you have sent me emails in the last year, two years. Why aren't you commenting on this? Why don't you, I, I just knew that the whole point of this, it, if, you're, if you are a black Muslim and, and, and you were evangelized by the prophet Muhammad yourself while in a prison cell, and you thought for three seconds once about voting for Donald Trump, guess what you are now? A Christian nationalist. This is always where it was going to go. All right. This is this is the new iteration of Mitt Romney's binders f- full of women. Uh, this is the new iteration of Nikki Haley's responsible for the Charleston shooting. Now, why did I just point out two Republicans whom I absolutely cannot stand? Because it doesn't matter what kind of Republican it is. You just have to be the person with the R after your name and the face of opposition in the election the left and media, but I repeat myself, wants to win, and there's a term du jour or something to blame you for. That's that's the game. That's the way it's being played. And so I just sat back and watched for a couple of years while well-meaning Christians debated each other on something as if it was sincere and nuanced from the start, and it never was. And then last week they come out and tell us in Politico, well, these people believe in natural law. This has gained popularity in the last few decades. Well, I guess time is now a uh, a fluid entity, much like gender. I mean, it's been gaining favor since about the 12th century when Thomas Aquinas wrote about it in 1265. But I guess that's a few decades now. Um, And then uh, then the new one was, uh, well, you guys believe your rights come from God. Well, I mean, so did the people who started the country. So now, if you love Jesus at all and have any respect at all for American history, you too are a Christian nationalist. Christian nationalists be flipping. We're all Christian nationalists now. Yes, we are all Christian nationalists now. And so my Christian nationalist children's book comes out a week from tomorrow. It is uh, book two in the trilogy on America's Christian heritage. Why Easter? Jesus died for us so we can live forever. A full gospel presentation. I'm really proud of how this turned out like I was with Why Thanksgiving. That was the first book. If you want to order it today, it's available for presales at Amazon.com. Why Easter is the name. Why Easter? Jesus died for us so that we could live forever, releasing a week from tomorrow. If you want an autographed edition, you can get one of those at premiercollectibles.com slash whyeaster, premiercollectibles.com slash whyeaster. Also, 
Catherine Engelbrecht of True the Vote will be joining us here at the bottom of the hour. Next hour, we're going to bring back Ask Me Anything. Uh, We just have been so swamped the last few weeks, so we haven't had opportunity uh, to bring back that regular segment. It returns next week. Todd has your questions where that's concerned. But a conversation that I know a lot of you are eager to hear, as am I. Catherine Engelbrecht, is, I went back and listened to the original t- uh, podcast we did with her. It's almost exactly 21 months to the day. May 24th, 2022 is when she was on the show to talk about to, her role in the documentary 2000 Mules, which at the time I found very captivating. Uh, she returns in response to claims that we talked about here on this show uh, that she could produce, her and her organization could produce no evidence Uh, to their claims in a Georgia court. She wants to clarify that. I also want you guys to know there are other things I want to ask her about that have come to light since we last had her on. And I also let Todd know through, you know, let her know through Todd. Didn't want to blindside her. So this isn't a gotcha interview. We just want to know what the truth is. So and and how often, Todd, do I let you know and let somebody know in advance what I'm going to ask him about? Uh, almost never. Almost never. In fact, often people will ask. Like Thanks. even friends of mine when they come on will ask, and I'll be like, I don't know, man. I'll figure out when we get on. Yeah. Right? Almost never. All right? But because, and I, and, and I don't know Catherine at all. I don't. But this is for, this is, this is for you guys. I, I know how much you care about this issue, and you know how much I care about this issue. I mean, speaking out on this issue has cost me quite a bit. Quite a lot of censorship, quite a lot of money, cost the blaze quite a lot of money on election night, in fact, and the day after. All right. So um, I, I, I'm doing this for you guys. I wanted to make sure you guys knew my all I want to know is what the truth is here. That's all. I just want to know what the truth is. And even if we're disappointed by the answers Catherine gives us at the bottom of the hour, it won't change anything about the problems with the chain of custody of these mail-in ballots that we saw in the 2024 or 2020 election. Freudian slip there with the 2024 that we saw in the 2020 election. And has anything been produced regardless of Jason Miller going on? Jason Miller told the January 6th committee, we told Trump he lost. He did that. We saw it. Yes. Said it under oath, in fact, right? And under the, a mask. Yeah. Yeah. And under a mask. Yes. Does that does that make you feel any better about? what the hell was going on in Maricopa County on election night 2022? Mm -hmm. Do we have any answers to that, really? No. No. Do we have any answers to how did the machines get Antrim County, Michigan so wrong? And how is it possible that all of these mail-in ballots came in uniformly and we had the the highest volume of them we've ever had, and yet we had the lowest return and rejection rate of them we've ever had? How how are those things even congruent in any world of, of reality? We do not know. Nothing's, nothing's been answered. So my thoughts on this pre-exist the existence of True the Vote and 2,000 Mules. They go back to the night of the election itself, calling it in real time with Glenn Beck. And to this day, I still don't have a lot of satisfaction, really none, no satisfactory answers on that. But there are, there are, ancil- there are corollary, you know, and, and tributaries and corollaries to this conversation that if they're wrong, see Lynn Wood and release the Kraken, um, it, it hurts the credibility of all of us trying yes. to get to the truth of this, right? And so I'm concerned about that. And, that, and I, I'm, I want to give Catherine uh, the opportunity to address those concerns. And to her credit, she is willing to come on and address them. So with that caveat, let us begin, as we always do with Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by the bitter effects of a witch's brew. And that witch's brew is a wide open border soft on crime policies in major cities and sanctuary cities in red states. 22-year-old University of Georgia nursing student Lakin Hope Riley is dead after being apparently randomly targeted and beaten to death by 26-year-old Jose Antonio Ibarra. Ibarra is an illegal alien from Venezuela who crossed over the southern border through El Paso, Texas, in 2022. Ibarra then made his way to New York City, where he was arrested and then released for injury of a child less than 17 years old. From New York, he made his way to Athens, Georgia, a sanctuary city. Lake and Hope Riley died of blunt force trauma on Thursday in what police described as a crime of opportunity after she went out for a jog. Associated Press, your thoughts. The killing of a nursing student out for a run highlights the fears of solo female athletes. Also at the border, Wisconsin Congressman Tom Tiffany says he's been provided footage of a felony taking place. The congressman says what you see here are workers for an NGO or non-governmental organization holding open a section of the border wall to let illegals through, which is, of course, a felony. 
One final thing on the border. This is from Bloomberg over the weekend. Venezuela's violent deaths fall to 22 year low on migration. Venezuela's rate of violent deaths dropped to its lowest level in more than two decades following years of massive migration as both criminals and victims fled the nation's economic crisis. Moving on, Oklahoma Superintendent of Public Instruction Ryan Walters and Libs of TikTok founder Shay O'Rashik are two high-profile names to be blamed by the trans mob and some politicians for the death of a so-called non-binary student at an Oklahoma high school last month. The story originally went that this non-binary student was being bullied in a bathroom when a fight broke out. The student was then viciously beaten and died from the injuries. Except none of that is true. Police said last week they're still determining a cause of death, said that the fight was broken up by other students and school nurses determined after the fight nobody needed to go to the hospital. Despite that, the non-binary student went to the hospital where she explained to police she didn't even know the girl she got into a fight with and started the fight herself. The next day, she was dead. Didn't stop the left from continuing to blame people like Shea Rashik for the student's death, like Taylor Lorenz of The Washington Post, who interviewed Rashik recently. Well, I guess, you know, um, a recent NBC investigation found at least 33 instances where you posted about a specific person or institution, and that person or institution was immediately bombarded with death threats and violent threats, um, including bomb threats, other violent threats. That's a pretty significant correlation. How do you... You know, what are your thoughts Yeah, on? I don't know if you saw, but I got like tons of death threats um, the past, this week after the entire media machine came after me. So are they responsible for those? I don't think that there is um, the same correlation. Are you receiving bomb threats? I'm, I'm receiving death threats like, hi, I'm going to come murder you. Yeah, and I definitely sympathize with you there. Like I get those literally the article goes live and then I get those threats. I get the same thing when a Fox News article goes live. So are the, is the journalist responsible, the journalist who posts the article? I would say, um, you know, there's a different responsibility when we're talking about media. And I, and I guess to me, a death threat is different than a violent bomb threat. In completely unrelated news, according to the UK Telegraph, 70% of so-called transgender prisoners in British jails are serving sentences for sex offenses and violent crimes. Learning Chinese today, today's phrase is... Huh. <laughs> a New York jury determined Friday former National Rifle Association Chief Wayne LaPierre must repay over $4 million back to the organization he helmed for 30 years. The jury found LaPierre misspent millions of dollars of the organization's money using the funds to pay for an extravagant lifestyle, including exotic getaways and trips on private planes and super yachts. My Pillow CEO Mike Lindell is on the hook for $5 million, according to a federal judge in Minneapolis. The judge ruled Lindell must pony up the millions of dollars to Robert Ziedman, a programmer who took part in a 2021 contest challenging computer programming experts to prove that data Lindell had in his possession was not from the 2020 election. Ziedman proved Lindell wrong, allegedly, and now Lindell must pay up. Lindell says he plans to appeal the ruling. And finally, Uber left-wing online publication Vice Media is basically no more. The struggling digital content company will lay off hundreds of workers and drastically shift its strategy, according to CEO Bruce Dixon. So long and farewell, Vice Media. Here's this from comedian Ryan Long. We as white bloggers set out on a mission to solve racism. And after calling every single thing racist, we might be done. You know, we found a way to call milk racist, hockey racist, football racist, camping, math, gym, gyms, AI, computers, robots, grocery stores. I guess there's nothing really left for us to call racist, so like, we're closing up shop. We call gay men racist, lesbians racist, knitting, scuba diving, archery, dentistry. We call dogs racist, meat eaters racist, vegans racist, buildings, Latinos, Chinese people, Dr. Seuss, Dr. Phil, chess. We called soda racist, glasses. I don't know if we necessarily need an award, but if we get an award. If an award comes our way, we'll take the award. Yeah. And that's what happened while we were away. Received this note, Aaron's Montage, brought to you by our friends over at Jace Medical. Received this note from Teresa Todd in Alabama. Uh, first thing this morning, my neighbor went to Leicester uh, Army Health Clinic to get her and her husband's medicines refilled. She and the others waiting were told that only life-saving prescriptions and only seven days' worth would be dispensed because insurance companies had a glitch. The patients were told that it was a military installation. Why? Germany, Korea, everybody was experiencing this. Nor should they bother with Walgreens, Walmart, CVS, or any other pharmacy because of the same glitch. 
meaning it was out in the gen pop. Later today, my husband used the Leicester Pharmacy phone refill call system to call in his refill. A recording played stating they were not accepting refill calls. Hey, what was that Jace Case contact info again? I know it. I'm already calling him just uh, being snarky. Again, that is uh, from uh, Teresa Todd there in Alabama. That's the message. Don't let that happen to you. JaceMedical.com, J-A-S-E. You can customize the Jace case so you or a loved one has a backup of the meds, you know, just in case we keep on. Let's go brandoning around here. JaceMedical.com. Use the code DACE as a promo for a discount. Promo code D-E-A-C-E. Promo code DACE at Jace Medical. J-A-S-E. JaceMedical.com. To the montage. And... You know, the old saying, a picture says a thousand words. The visual there, forget about the content. Like, let's pretend you didn't hear anything going on in the, in, in the back and forth between Shia Rashik and Taylor Lorenz. You, 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 didn't heard a, you didn't hear a word of it, okay? And just the photo here, of two relatively attractive white women. One of them just out and about in Florida on a sidewalk cafe wearing sunglasses. The other one outdoors wearing a mask. Is that not essentially? I mean, you know, before we get into any of the the nuanced worldview issues or whatever specific issues they were talking about. Before we get into anything specific, guys, just tell me about that visual in and of itself and what it says. Two women conversing back and forth. And one of them, one of them looks normal and well-adjusted. Comfortable. Comfortable. The other one is completely uncomfortable and is eager to show off a psychosis. Is that, is that one of the best pictures of where we are as a country that we've ever seen since we started doing this show together? That visual contrast between these two women? Well, particularly... You know, it's not just a conversation amongst civilians. I mean, I, 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 there's not a moment I've taken what's her face seriously since I figured out when. I mean, had you ever heard of her before two or three years ago? Taylor Lorenz. Yeah, I had no idea I had who never, she was. Yeah, but she she works everywhere. I mean, she's your teacher. I didn't know what a post Malone was until yeah. the Super Bowl. My kids laughed at me, so I'm at that stage now. She's your teacher. She's your journalist. She's yeah. your every there. Yeah, They're everywhere. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we're used to s- stupid people talking about stuff that are way beyond them. Okay, tale as old as time. But like, the, the, how does she have a job? How is she serious on any level? Because she's legion. We're going to get to that point next. But I, this is just the, the entry point question. But Aaron, yeah. do you want to comment on this visual? Yeah, I mean, you set up that scene. Here's Taylor Lorenz in this massive mask in the year 2024, outdoors, in the sunshine, covering half of her face. She's sitting up straight, talking in ostensibly a normal voice, I would say. And Shea Rashik is basically reclining in her chair with her sunglasses on. Body language just saying F you and wearing a T-shirt featuring a real photograph yeah. of Taylor Lorenz crying right. hysterically. You can't share a country. I mean, that's don't want to step on anything here, but that, no, that visual, can't. that no. visual alone tells you. Those I don't want these that. two groups of people cannot live together. I mean, they just can't not not peaceably. I mean, there would have to be some form of self-separation. Like, maybe they can live in detente together. Hey, you know, we have some common strategic interest in the world. You know, and I live in, um, I live in my, you know, psychosis is normal part of the, the, that, you know, world. And uh, you live in your uh, relaxed and uh, what me worry part of that world. Okay. 
Um, but we, I mean, we obviously can't live together. I mean, we, we just can't. Maybe we can be in alignment strategically, geopolitically of some common enemies. But that's, there's no, there's a zero e pluribus unum happening in that visual, mm-hmm. right? Nothing. Like absolutely nothing. I've talked about this before. The reason why, uh, if, if, if the moral, if the moral calculus and evil of slavery was viewed by the generations of the time and and there were plenty who viewed it as evil and most did not to participate but if if it was if it was viewed as a bridge too far from the outset they would have addressed it from the outset right they, sure. they every generation has blind spots no generation is perfect every generation has things that you know it needs the next generation to correct they would have just said okay we, we can't move on right now here in philadelphia at this con we we have to stop right now we cannot ratify a document that says all men are created equal and then not address the obvious canard and elephant you know sitting here in the room right but they didn't do that i mean they they, they did address it but then once it became a bridge too far they just kind of moved on and you know, we'll, have, we'll kick the can down the road and tackle that one later, right? The reason why it became the lightning rod issue is because other than different, you know, we were in the mid in the mid nineteenth century. We're still in the very nascent stages of an indus- of the industrial revolution at this time. I mean, we're we're, we're still you're still a lifetime from Henry Ford, almost a lifetime, 50, 60 years from Henry Ford creating the assembly line. You know, I mean, the urbanization of America is just underway, just underway. I mean, in the, in the, in the next, in the next 70 years, New York city's population will grow by 500% basically. But we're at the very, be, at the time shots are fired at Fort Sumter, we're at the very beginning of, the, of that era. We're on the upper, we're, we're going up that curve of societal development industrially. And so there really weren't even that many differences from agrarian society to urban industrial society because most of it was, was agrarian society. The industrial stuff was the exception. So really, there's one thing that is really separating the North and the South. And what is it? Slavery. Slavery. That, that's really, you know, outside of different, you know, you know, local customs and stuff, but nothing that would have seemed foreign to you. Hey, we, we do grits down here and not oatmeal. Okay. I mean, nothing that would have made you think I just, I came here from Pennsylvania and I don't feel comfortable here in South Carolina. But no. Nowadays, that's not the case though, right? Right. Right. But back then, it was it was it, it it was not the case. It would have it would have, if you were Pennsylvania, it would have seemed weird for you to just see people just led around as slaves based on the color of their skin. Take that issue off the table, and not much else would have seemed weird. Just the accents are different. And even with and even though, even when finally they couldn't outrun that one catastrophic moral difference between the two sides they they tried for many many years they're like hey man business is good do this compromise that compromise kick the can down the road we'll figure this out you know the money's too good we got gold in california well i mean this manifest destiny thing we've got chinese labor building our railroads out here things are going great okay there's no need to get all you know wickety whack over this one issue except that one issue ended up mushrooming into a much larger one because you can't outrun the you can't outrun the laws of nature and nature's god you can't you just can't it'll seem for a while like you are but really all you're doing is running towards dealing with them in an even more catastrophic way than if you had dealt with it right at the outset right Mm -hmm. other than they're both relatively attractive white women what do shia rashik and taylor lorenz have in common i mean they look alike right they're both white women okay both intelligent right sure accents are very similar right beyond those things what do they have in common nothing i mean Outside of each being made in the likeness and image of God and the surface level similarities I just mentioned, when we get down to who we are inside out, there's no, 
there's not like one issue dangling over them that maybe they can get around. Every issue dangles over them. Everyone does. I mean, Taylor Lorenz and that just did that entire interview could be a montage, frankly. I mean, Aaron just shows the one clip where Taylor's like, well, I mean, basically, if, you know, if if the people that, that if I'm producing death threats against you, I just don't think it meets the threshold as if you're producing death threats against people that are in my constituency. That is the language of civil war. I mean, essentially, what you saw there was like in two generals sitting down and discussing, you know, terms of engagement. Hey, you're not allowed to bomb my troops. Well, you bomb mine. That, that, that's what that was. That, that's what that was. That's what that whole thing is. But here's the real problem we have. Before you get really eager for like, hey, yeah, this is where this needs to go. Before you get really eager and anxious for this, you ready for the Paul Harvey rest of the story? Their side has many more Taylor Lorenzes than our side has Raisha, or has, has, it, it has, has it just way more, way more. It's not even close. And their side, their side's Taylor Lorenzes are, as Todd mentioned a minute ago, They're your teachers. They're your school board members. They're, your, they're in the media. They're on the faculty. Healthcare. Healthcare. Oh, yeah. You're, yeah. They're still they're your dancing nurses. They are legion, no pun intended. And the amount of races we have are not high, which is why which is why you've seen her go from someone none of us knew who she was three or four years ago to she's one of the biggest names in our, in our industry and movement right now. Because she just started doing stuff that our people don't typically do. Stand up to their people. <laughs> All right? That's, that, our people don't typically do that. All right? You know, we just kind of, oh, I, I, I guess the courts have spoken. Oh, I guess the media called me a racist. Oh, I guess, you know, I might lose my job. Oh, I guess, you know... Um, you know, Aunt uh, Yakety Sacks, you know, has spoken at Thanksgiving. I'll just pipe down now because the wife's giving me the look, right? Yes. That's what our people typically do. So here's this, you know, Rachel, I'm not going to do that. I'm done doing that. And because of that, she went from some, you know, Jewish housewife, no one knew four years ago, to top five, top 10 name in conservative media in the movement right now. Fair? Yeah. Maybe. It's amazing. It is just by standing up to these people. That's all. And how did she stand up to them, by the way? Posting their own words. Just posting their own content. Yep. That's all. Showing us who they were. Which they were eager to show. We just chose to willfully ignore. I don't... I suspect my children's first grade teacher with the unicorn hairline and the 75 piercings and the trans flag, you know, um, uh, you know, beanie baby on her desk... Something doesn't smell right, but you know what, man? I'm working three jobs, and I'm just going to ignore it right now because I need this state-sanctioned Jake. I, I, so I'm just going to let them program my kid, right? Yeah. Eh, no, we're not going to do that anymore. And that's a problem. Also notice, again, it was two women. Wanted to save the worst for last. It was two women. Where are the men having these kinds of conversations? Where's the where's the male version of libs of TikTok saying calling the uh, male version of Taylor the Ren saying, "Hey, we're gonna sit down and have a little conversation about this." Where's that happening at? Do you know? Yeah, neither do I. I don't know either. I don't either. So, there's more, way more of their kind of women than ours. And we still have like no men. Other than that. Other than that, though, I think there's a great opportunity here for us to save America. More in a moment.
Well, as we get more and more signs of shortages, deep economic problems that we're going to try to mask with things like so-called student loan forgiveness, which is really just executive mandated theft and others you know, just might want to make sure you have your ducks in a row because you never know when another emergency you never know when it might be time to let's go brandon yet again that's where our friends at my patriot supply come in uh if you want to get started in preparedness just to make sure you are well prepared uh many of you end up starting with the four-week emergency food kit that's 16 food and drink varieties well over a dozen Options to mix and match, so you've always got a variety. Up to 25 years, they stay good with proper shelf life. Uh, And you get the full 2,000-plus calories a day that you need. That's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, even drinks and snacks. And you can get each four-week kit for 60 bucks off and free shipping right now. If you want to protect yourself, your family, protect your people, start by preparing at preparewithdace.com. That's preparewithdace.com. $60 off and free shipping on each kit at preparewithdace.com. Let's welcome into the program Catherine Engelbrecht from True the Vote. It is good to have you back with us, Catherine. How are you? Hey, Steve. Doing great. I went back and uh, listened to when we had you on originally. It is almost exactly 21 months to the day, by the way. That was May 24th, 2022. Um, And so it was shortly after I had a chance to watch and review 2,000 Mules. And as I said to the audience, I want to make sure I just get everything out here in the outset so you know where I'm coming from. I, I still have received no satisfactory answers from what transpired on election night 2020 when we get to a chain of custody of mail-in ballots. Um, what in the world went on with the original reporting of returns in places like Antrim County, Michigan? You know, I helped anchor our coverage of, of that night here on The Blaze, and I just spotted so many irregularities just watching returns, just knowing how elections work. Um, you know, I, I just pointed things out on the air that eventually got our entire channel demonetized by Facebook. I've been censored and demonetized more times than I can count and I still think someone, someone, I don't, I'm not entirely sure who, but someone ought to be arrested for whatever the hell that was that happened in Maricopa County in 2022. All right. But some things have come up with some of the corollaries of this story that I am concerned about. I, I am concerned when I see Mike Lindell lose a lawsuit from a Trump voter who, who says he went to prove his claims and the court ended up actually sided and, and he diff, couldn't find any evidence for his claims. And the court actually sided with the Trump voter over Mike Lindell, who's now telling people not to ballot harvest, not to do early voting, which is what the other side is doing to death to us. I am concerned when Jason Miller tells the January 6th commission under oath that they told the president from the beginning that he lost because, you know, there are people, as you know, Catherine, that are still in prison as we speak because they don't believe that. So I I just want to know what the truth is. And when I saw a couple of weeks ago that the the ruling of a Georgia court, I'm not going to lie, that got my spidey sense tingling in light of the last two examples that I just mentioned to you. So I wanted to, the court basically says you guys provided them no evidence of your claims. I know you think there's much more to it than that. So I want to give you the floor now to clarify and explain. Sure. Well, so the court didn't say that. Uh, The court... The, the media said that uh, what we were responding to, and let me take it a half a step back uh, to, to be very specific, w- what you were reacting to, uh, and we got all kinds of reports about that reaction. So we share a lot of the same viewers that sense the, the disconnect. And I'm so glad that we're having the opportunity to visit about it because just as I shared with you back in, in May of 2022, that story is exactly the same uh, then as today. But there have been many lawsuits in between. The lawsuit that was called into question or made headlines last week was a a lawsuit, kind of an oddly framed lawsuit against uh, us filed by the state election board. And the way this all came down is that, that, and and this is, and one of the reasons it's strange is because what has happened to us here has has apparently never happened before in the history of Georgia, uh, in the history of the state election board. So this is all new ground that a state election board would would sue on the basis of a citizen's filed complaint. We filed a complaint in November of 2021. They followed up on it a year later, and 
and the long and the short of it is where we are as of last week was um, headlines made over a document that was filed back in December. A document that that where that where the court com, uh, there was a motion to compel. We had to provide information, and so we did. We provided over six thousand documents to the state election board, and and went through line by line in the subpoena to respond. As I mentioned, that was filed back in December, but interestingly, it became headline news on the same day last week that Fannie Willis uh, was, was surprisingly took the seat to testify in, in, the, in the Fulton County case. And so it's our opinion that that, that was conjured um, in, a, in an attempt to distract. And the headline to say that we had no evidence is, is nonsense. We, we, as I mentioned, we filed over 6,000 documents with them and then wanted to enter into further conversations. So it's just it's just it's just misinformation. We you know it, and it's disappointing. It's it was shocking to us to see those headlines made and to know that those stories must have been um, pre-written and just ready to drop on a, on you know for at a convenient time. And that time was last week. Can you share with us just a handful of examples of? the pieces of evidence that, that you did submit to the court? Would you say there were about 6,000? Is that what you just said? Could you share with us like a sure. handful of those kinds of examples of what you submitted to the court? Sure. Well, so they wanted, you know, anything that, that had to do with our investigation um, around the geospatial evidence. And, and we provided everything that we had gotten from patterns of life that included the uh, cell devices information. We provided all of the open record responses that we got that, that began to kind of put the puzzle pieces in place for us and what was going on with Georgia. You, know, made, you made a very important point. There are still a lot of questions that remain about what happened in 2020 because of the uh, absence of things like chain of custody documents that, that should tell the full picture. Um, so we provided everything that we had that got us to the place that um, that led us to file that initial complaint with the court. What we what we didn't provide and still can if the court wants it um, is the petabytes worth of of raw data, but that would take a pretty significant lift of both resources and time. And the question is this, Steve: They have so they've let the clock run out on on any standard by which they could prosecute anything that was found if they actually investigated. They, they could have been investigating this since we first presented it to them in the beginning of 2021. They've done nothing. So now here we are, 2024, where, where there's really no hook to hang anything on any longer. And it begs the question, what's this really all about? And, and does the court really want us to go down the path of months worth of investigation if, in fact, uh, if in fact there's no um, there, there's no there's no bottom to it, mm -hmm. or is this ju or is this just an effort to harass us and to send an important message uh, from them to any other organization or citizen or whistleblower who might think about coming forward? And that is, don't you dare, because this is what will happen. So you've pretty much been in court, Catherine, one way or the other for the last two years is what you're telling us for various reasons involving <laughs> your, your documentary. Have you guys ever been sanctioned for making false claims? Have you had anything dismissed with prejudice because of what you guys were stating or asserting was just viewed as laughable by the court? Anything, anything that was punitive in response to any of these various legal actions? No, and I'll go one step further. We stand by 100% of the information that was provided. It was initially all provided to the FBI because we were we were looking. Our, our research um, was was across five different jurisdictions, and we thought we were looking at a RICO potential. Mm -hmm. They told us that they couldn't do anything with it because there was no money nexus. They arbitrarily chose. You know, we had to. What they told us is you had to have a be able to prove a $50,000 money nexus between the states in order for them to get involved, which makes no sense given now what we, you know, what we know now that we didn't know then, but that's what they said. And they offered to help us set up our data in the various jurisdictions, which made a lot of sense to us. Going back to your comment about chain of custody, it made a lot of sense because we thought, okay, we're going to 
be able to provide this one time in each of the jurisdictions and then any um, other law enforcement agency will be able to come back and um, and 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 refer back and it will all be it will all be consistent. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what we saw with every single jurisdiction was that they chose to just pigeonhole it. But we stand by it all. It's it's solid data. We're right. Um, and, you know, it's it's sad to say that it's never going to be investigated, but it doesn't appear that it will be. I'm looking at a mailer you guys sent out uh, back in uh, March of last year. I want to share a portion of the mailer. In the metro Atlanta area, analysis of geopolitical data confirmed that 242 intermediaries made 5,668 individual stops at drop boxes between October 12, 2020, when early voting began, and January 6, 2021, the date of the United States Senate runoff election. The timestamps in the geospatial data were then uh, used to identify drop box visits in the surveillance video. The video confirms these intermediaries were, in fact, making repeated visits to drop boxes, depositing multiple ballots on each visit. In many instances, the video show intermediaries attempting to deposit so many ballots that they were unable to fit into the drop box slot with ballots uh, and ballots are seen falling to the ground. The same patterns emerged in Maricopa County, where more than 202 intermediaries made 4,282 individual drop box visits during that time period. Did, did you guys submit that specific evidence to the Georgia court? No, we offered it, but the irony here is they already have that evidence. They have it because we provided it to them in 2021. They have it because the video was theirs to begin with. If the court wants us to go through the the steps of um, re you know recompiling everything and providing it, then then that's what they need to tell us. But we've 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 tried to make the point. You guys have had this since 2021. Just use what we've already given you, which again, brings me back around to, to my belief that this is just stagecraft. This is, this is about nothing. It is, it is a smoke screen. We have been here presenting evidence year after year after year, and yet they do nothing. They just pull out the, you know, the scurrilous headlines whenever it suits them. And, and it's, it's, it's just a sad state of affairs, but our, our, our facts are our facts and they've never changed. I mentioned earlier, I went back and listened to our original interview on uh, May 22nd or May 24th, 2022. And one of the points you made in the interview, uh, you expressed a lot of the same frustration you're expressing now in that interview. Uh, but but you said that um, you were having positive, constructive conversations with sheriff associations around the country. So in the in the 21 months since we last discussed this with you, have you had any law enforcement on a local or state level um, identify who these mules were, arrest anybody for uh, election fraud or anything of that nature, any form of skullduggery? What what sort of what sort of active assist uh, help have you received from local law enforcement that you were talking about 21 months ago? Well, <clears throat> at that time, um, we were probably I was probably referring specifically to what was going on in Arizona. And yet there were indictments that were made, unfortunately, as it you know tends to go um, after the election of 2022, which, as you pointed out, you still have questions about, as do we uh, in in key counties across Arizona, leadership changed out and then the the investigations were dropped, but not before there were two indictments made. Uh, we provided much information. In fact, that was represented, and we had a whistleblower from Arizona in the in the movie 2000 Mules. That was encouraging, and we did work with local sheriffs there to support them. Um, we worked with uh, some a sheriff in particular in Michigan, thinking that they, that the sheriff would be able to although it was outside of his jurisdiction, Detroit, which was where we had done our study, Wayne County, Detroit, was outside of his jurisdiction. Uh, there seemed to be, uh, for period, we believe, some case law that suggested that that sheriff could work outside of his jurisdiction because it impacted his constituents if there was a, if there was a, an unlawful election in another jurisdiction. That proved to not uh, hold quite the weight we had hoped. 
you know, but, but I, I will say so, and it, you know, Arizona was a win, Michigan, not so much. Um, we have tried to press into other areas in Atlanta. I mean, if I could do anything again with the research project that we took on the geospatial research, what I would have done is added in some control areas where we knew we had uh, law enforcement posed and ready to help and ready to investigate should we find anything. And, and we didn't do that. We went with just five hot areas and, and that left us, you know, with, with a, a, a limited opportunity to really be fairly heard. So that's where we are. I've got about two minutes. One of the most dynamic moments, I think, in the film is when you guys talk about how the use of this technology, you turned over some of your discoveries to help with a, with a couple of murder cases in Georgia. NPR reported that, and it's NPR, okay? So let's throw that out there with a giant disclaimer, but it's a, they're directly quoting somebody. Nellie Miles, who's uh, the Georgia Bureau of Investigations Director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs, says, quote, the GBI did not receive information from True the Vote that connected to the Sicaria, I think that was her name, a Turner investigation. OK, I want mm-hmm. to give you a chance to respond to that, because that was one of the pieces of evidence to show, hey, this is something that is legit, that is used in other areas. We're not just, you know, our reach isn't just exceeding our grasp to buttress our narrative here in this one area. I've got a minute left. I'll give it to you. Go ahead. Thanks so much. This is a Corey Turner case. And yes, we did give it, but not to the GBI. We didn't give it to the GBI because they had already done nothing with the information we provided them earlier that year. Through the FBI, we provided the information on two murders in the metro Atlanta area to a joint task force of the Atlanta FBI and the Atlanta police force. So it is true. And, you know, it's, 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 Classic, right? If you don't want the answer, don't ask the question or don't ask it to the right people. Mm -hmm. We gave it to the FBI and the Atlanta Police Department who did nothing with it. We also reached out to the family of Sequoia Turner because her family was suing the, the city of Atlanta over her horrible murder. And we offered support there. Stand by everything we've ever said. They just don't want the truth to be unearthed. And there we are. I've got 30 seconds. Is there... Anything you do over again, knowing what you know now over the last 21 months, you just mentioned one thing, but anything else here in about 20 seconds? Um, you know, I, I, I think... I think back on it, we broke new ground. I look at how many places now recognize cell phone data uh, Mm -hmm. as being valid. We won. We won the argument. We're moving on, and we have much bigger things to be concerned about in 2024. We should learn the lessons of the past and be stronger in the months ahead. Catherine, thank you very much for coming on and answering questions. Speaks well of you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Steve. You bet. We'll come back. It'll be your turn to ask me anything. And I've got a uh, disclaimer or an update on something we talked about last week. I got to address too when we return. We're back with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Totters and Aaron McIntyre and all of you. And you can all let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. Just email us, Steve, at SteveDace.com, D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also, if you listen via the podcast, leave us a five-star review if you like the show, of course. And thank you to all of you, the thousands of you who have. Uh, also, make sure to hit to subscribe on your podcast platform. And if it's iTunes, you need to hit follow. That way, every time we do a new episode, Episode, it will show up in your feed every single time. And thank you to all of you that have done that for us, too. Thanks to our friends over at Hillsdale College, uh, who sponsors this part of the program. They're trying to do something about the crisis in American education, particularly what Hillsdale calls civic education. I mean, for decades, young people have not been being properly taught about America's heritage. And that's why young Americans are uh, the, this is the generation most likely to reject the creeds that America was founded on, that all think that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator, were certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that uh, these are according to the laws of nature and nature's God. You know all these things. But chances are, if you're 18 to 30, 
You don't know him as much as any other previous generation of America did. And you certainly don't believe him that much. That's why Hillsdale is producing 60-second radio spots called Constitution Minutes. If you want to hear one of their Constitution Minutes or share it with a young person you know, just go to daceforhillsdale.com. Daceforhillsdale.com. While you're there, you can reserve a free pocket copy of the Constitution as well, courtesy of Hillsdale College. That's daceforhillsdale.com. Once again, daceforhillsdale.com. Com. All right, I want to make sure I update something uh, before we get to ask me anything. If you guys are wondering uh, what we're going to do in the overtime today, I, I wanted to give Catherine as much of the segment as I possibly could to get her side of the story out. And so uh, Todd and Aaron are going to share their reactions you'd normally hear during the show right after an interview. You're going to hear those in the overtime today. Uh, we have not discussed this at all other than I said to Todd uh, during the break, make sure to thank Catherine for coming. Uh, short of that, we have not gotten into our thoughts on the interview at all. In fact, I asked Todd and Aaron to keep it to themselves, so they've got some time uh, to mull it over, and uh, we'll record the overtime right after the show, and we'll put you guys, tee you guys up, and we'll find out what you thought. And that'll be for Blaze TV subscribers, blazetv.com slash dace. That's blazetv.com slash dace. That's where you want to go. Uh, if you're a subscriber, you'll be able to watch that later today, blazetv.com slash dace. If you're not yet a Blaze TV subscriber, you can go there right now to become one, blazetv.com slash dace, so you can watch that overtime later today and all the other exclusive content that we do. But uh, a story that we talked about last week on the program involving St. Patrick's Cathedral, which was overrun by essentially, I don't know what else to call it, um, you know, literally like a, a dry run of the Visigoths, essentially. Is that, is that a fair characterization? All right. Uh, calling, uh, who was it they were cheering for? The some the, the, horrors. The, the, yeah. yeah, the chief of horrors or something. Okay. And I mean, not an empty seat. And, you know, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, that's his parish. Uh, he had been, uh, he's very well known. You've seen him in the media a ton over the years. He's spoken at both parties, political conventions in recent times. And at first he said, he, we were, we pointed out uh, when we talked about this story midweek last week that he's been quiet as kept. I referenced that again on Friday. I, I think I heard from every Catholic in this audience, okay, who wanted to correct me, all right? Uh, and so I wanted to make sure, I heard about, I got all these emails after the show, so I wanted to make sure I updated this on today's show. I'll just use this one because I could have read like 50 of these, but I'll just use this one. Uh, Anna Marie Liptak says, there was more to that story that was ignored by most media. The staff at the church was apparently blindsided. They did cut the scheduled service after all the evil behavior took place. It was to be a funeral service and a full mass. They did not proceed with the mass and ended it as a service only. Cardinal Dolan did approve of the actions taken by the staff on his podcast after the event. The cathedral also held a mass of reparation to counter uh, the de desecration that took place. I am Catholic, but I had to dig hard to find the rest of this story. So, Todd, as our resident Catholic, your thoughts as we issue that update. I, I knew quite a bit of that uh, already, but listen, I, no matter what happened, the, the, we're, we need to be wise as serpents. Okay. And d did anybody's, I, I get being blindsided on, on some of, I mean, these people are liars, but uh, really how bad, how big was the lie? This is uh, don't did who came and initially who did you talk to on the phone who did you talk to in person how did this even get in the door in the first place listen let's face it a lot of it has to do the c compassionate lies we tell ourselves on the inside as catholics and christians all the time so i i mean steve's obviously doing this because no matter what he does just like with true the vote the truth whatever it is he wants to know it so He's the fact that uh, he got enough volume on this so that he, he shows that he's on the up and up. Just make sure you're on the up and up uh, with yourself because we, you know darn well that the lies we self in the name of so-called compassion is, is really evidence number one of why we get in these places in the first place. Just following up on that as well, the family, I believe, of the mother of all whores, is, I, I believe they were calling for the church to apologize, saying that, no, the church did know. 
Because the church tried to come out afterwards and say, we didn't know that this was going to turn in. We didn't know what this was. And the family is claiming, no, you guys did know. We did tell you that. So I just a land of confusion at the moment. I don't understand how this works within Catholicism. And my understanding also is it could be wrong. I believe St. Patrick's Cathedral is also a national landmark. I would imagine. So, so I, yeah. there, I don't know if that broadens the ability for people to get access to it. I don't, I don't, I don't know all that, you know, um, how that works, but can you, can you enlighten us at all based on what you know, it, 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 what would be the vetting process to give people access to your pulpit, um, for a service? I mean, can they believe yeah. anything? Uh, is it would it be different, say, at your local parish than one that's a national landmark at St. Pete Patrick's Cathedral? Do they are they required? Of course, I would argue uh, no civil law. At, you know, that's what people like Aquinas thought, too, by the way. No civil going back to 1265. No civil law gets to tell the church to not be the church. Right. OK. Um, but is that an is that an excuse? Is it can they can they hide behind some sort of civil law as to why such miscreants would be given access to hold? Of that level of uh, abomination of desolation in the church anyway. Now, here's what I think happened. I've got a little bit of experience with this. Uh, my, f- my former parish, uh, when my children were very little, and a young man who had gone to school there was in high school, and uh, he committed uh, suicide. And the f- so th- this is a funeral thing. I think whatever guard is up is or lack thereof is even lowered even further in times like this in Mm -hmm. times of mourning. Uh, you know, I think people have their own versions of what it means. Uh, mercy triumphs over, uh, judgment. And so in, in the case of that suicide, these, these, the parents wanted to donate the money. They were of some means to build a chapel at the elementary school. But fine. Okay. But then they wanted to have, the chapel named after their son and myself and and another uh had to remind everybody and we took some slings and arrows but you don't suicide is a sin you don't mm-hmm. you, you do not do that he's not a saint we pray for him hopefully this all works out in the end in eternity but everybody was more like well this is kind of awkward and this is really hard. well Do we have standards or don't we? Because our standards are are for the hard times and for the hard cases. So we don't get run over by this kind of thing. Hmm. I I, I say that I think a version of that, it has less to do with about any legalese or anything like that. It has to do with we let ourselves increasingly in all matters that are at all challenging. We let ourselves get as stupid as possible. And I think that's just, there's no way they are totally, the church is totally innocent in this, in terms of just being utterly bamboozled by this at some level, their compassion made them stupid. Okay. All right. Well, are we good? I wanted to make sure we updated that story. Well, that's nice. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to do that. want to make sure, Hey, we're just trying to pursue whatever the truth is around here. That's all. With that said, let's do some Ask Me Anything. We haven't had a chance to do this in a few weeks. It used to be a Monday staple not too long ago. So we uh, wanted to make sure the first opportunity we had, we brought it back. We love these interactions. We love snotty questions. You guys know the drill. Maybe you don't because it's been a bit. It's been a minute. Uh, but to, we post on one of our social media platforms, and, and this week it's Facebook. Uh, we, we post a solicitation for questions. No topic is off limits. I don't see any of these questions ahead of time. Todd sees them. Uh, he selects the questions, and then uh, Aaron, uh, you deliver them, and I hear them for the first time when the audience does. So. We will begin with Braden Knight, who asks, How do I know God is showing me the next phase in my journey as a believer in Christ? I feel a strong pull to protect people for a career, but I want to make sure this pull is coming from God and Christ and not just me grasping for a change. Thanks for answering. So, um, not knowing you at all, because that, that kind of factors into this. Okay, I mean, yeah. it factors into how you process things, you know? Um you are an individual named Braden. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. The creator of the universe has counted all of the hairs on your head. He knits you in your mother's womb. You are not Steve Dace or Todd Erzin or Aaron McIntyre or 
anybody else. You're just you. And so there's some general things about conviction and direction that are true. But then after that, like there's some general things about how to be a good husband that are generally true, right? Don't slap your wife around. Don't cheat on her. Those things are, you know, Mm -hmm. provide for your family. Those things are generally true, right? True. But then what does that mean for your wife after those general things and for Aaron's wife and for mine, they're individual women. They have their own individual needs, wants, desires, preferences, right? And that's part of an intimate relationship is you grow in the knowledge of those things so that you then grow closer and, and more intimate together. And that, that works in your relationship with your creator too. So I, I'm hesitant to give too many specifics because of everything I just said, but I, I'll give you one thing that I do think is a general rule. In general, you know, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, right? The, the, you guys know that we run off the fruit of the spirit there from the scriptures, all right? Is um, anxiousness one of the fruit of the spirit? No. Is uh, guilting me into doing something uh, one of the fruit of the spirit? No. Shaming me into doing something one of the one of the fruit of the spirit? No. No. Okay. In general, the the conviction that comes from the Lord in general it, it, it exhibits the fruit of the spirit. I'll just give you an example from my own life. I woke up one morning very early in COVID. And I I cannot explain it to you. I just had 100% certainty. 100% even came in here and told these guys when I got in that morning. I'm on the earth for this moment right here primarily. I was conceived by a 15-year-old girl in 1972 so I, so I would be here at this moment and, and I am to take all of the whatever, you know, amount that is, but all of the credibility I'd worked very hard to build up over the last, you know, 10 plus years working in this business. And, it, and all of that was the prelim. This is the championship round. I am to push all my chips into the, into the, in, under the table, go all in. This is the moment. I'm here primarily on her. I mean, I'm, I'm not, did I say solely here on this earth? No. no, I'm here to be Amy's husband. I'm here to be Anna and, and Zoe and Noah's dad, soon to be Autumn's granddad. I'm here to be uh, you guys' friends. I'm here to be you guys' employer. It, it's not the sole reason I'm here, but the primary purpose of why I'm here, why certain things just had to happen for me to be where I was, certain gifts and things were just given to me that I cannot explain, was for this moment. For this moment, and to go all in, what's happening here is evil and demonic, and be credible. Don't be disqualified for the prize. Don't don't waste those um, metrics that I just defined, but exploit them fully. Go all the way in. Once, you, once you're confident, you're right. Don't hesitate. Take the shot. I just knew. And, and, that, and that's why I wasn't anxious or nervous. I just, and that lasted for well over a year. I just knew. I just knew this is why I'm here. And so this is my race and I am to finish it. In general, when you feel shame, the, 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 the book of Hebrews says that Jesus went to the cross despising the shame. The, the first verse in the Bible after sin enters in the world is, or the first verse in the Bible before sin enters the world, I should say, is they were naked in the garden and they had no shame. Anything that shames you, um, makes you feel um, anxious or gives you anxiety, that's uh, uh, as a general rule that is not from your creator anxiety usually comes from the enemy resolve usually comes from your creator i'm confident saying that generally but after that you know i think we're all individually and fearfully wonderfully made and i would I would maybe take that to somebody who knows you better and the way your mind works. Because what I hear you saying is, I want to make sure I'm not retconning God, and that's a good thing, okay? But I don't know you well enough to know how you would 
you know, fashion a narrative to suit what you want the outcome to be. I don't know you well enough to know that, you know. Um, there are people who know me well enough to know that, and that's why I'll take things to them to, to check my own work on stuff, you know. So I'd, I'd find a, you know, preferably be, be like a dad. We don't have a lot of those in this day and age, unfortunately. You know, preferably an older man who knows you, loves you, cares about you. Take it to him, maybe, or at least a peer group. That's what I would do. But in general, if you're feeling anxious, anxiety, shame, that's the enemy. If you feel contentment, resolve, and almost like a, a quiet confidence, that's usually from above. Next question. Next, we go to Dina Brat, uh, Bratley, who says, I grew up a Jehovah's Witness before becoming a Christian, and I've rarely heard any Christian speaker reference them with such depth and understanding of the history and inner workings. Do you have a personal history with the group are you com- that you're comfortable talking about, or are you just well-versed in it from theological discussions? A little bit of both. Um, I, I always There was always the one Jehovah's Witness kid in class growing up uh, in Florida. I lived in Florida uh, during three years when I was in elementary school, the Orlando area. We had a Jehovah's Witness kid in the class every year at different schools. And you always knew who they were because they wouldn't participate in any of the birthday or holiday celebrations or bring anything for holidays. Um, I had a couple family members uh, who went to Jehovah's Witness, and so I was curious what they believed. But a lot of my knowledge of Jehovah's Witnesses comes from, um, you know, the period of time I've talked about previously, where three years after, about a three-year period after my conversion, man, I just, you know, I went hardcore on renewing my mind and boot camp, you know, and studied a lot of this stuff. You know, uh, so for example, I mean, I, I, don't, I will confess, I don't know the latest bylaws and regulations, you know, they've changed in the last few years. Um, but, you know, um, you guys can, uh, Jehovah's Witness can only read the Bible and study the Bible at Kingdom Hall under supervision. Um, your original founder wrote his own version of the Bible called, I think it's called the New World Translation. And it's a lot of it is, is similar to, your, to, to, to the actual Bible, but a few verses are changed. Uh, for example, uh, it refer, Jesus is referred to as a son of God and not the son of God, for example. Um, um, and, and the guy who founded the Jehovah's Witness religion who wrote his own Bible later admitted under oath in court that he didn't know how to read either Greek or Hebrew. He didn't know either language, which would make it very difficult to qualify for establishing your own Bible translation. And a lot of this guy, it's a, what's his name? Uh, Charles uh, Taze Russell, I think is who it is. Something like that. Sounds right. He's been scrubbed from a lot of your history. Because you guys are, your cult leaders are rightfully embarrassed of him. Because he was a total fraud. But yeah. All right, next question. Next, we go to J.C. Fisher. In the last several weeks, our Bible study has been going through First Peter. The topic raised mainly by me arose about us as Christians submitting to government authority and persecution. And to define the parameters of that as we were talking about the likely upcoming persecution and also in light of the massacres in Nigeria. What's drawing the line to submitting to authority? What qualifies as that authority? And what are our options of self-defense and preservation? The question is, when are we allowed to fight or do we submit? It's a decision that we may all have to make soon. I include in this, this has come up a lot in the last couple of years during Ask Me Anything. And the fact that, I mean, obviously people aren't listening to every show. We have new people coming on. I, but I gots to know, are, like, what is it about like standard level formation that this thing is this consuming to people? It is, it is obviously a thorn in the flesh for people. That other stuff, they don't see the new... They, nuance in they roll right past they figure it out on their own is there something about because catholics have our stuff where we like what is this this seems to be like marian apparition kind of stuff for protestants like dealing with this one thing why is it so consuming i'm genuinely curious it was a topic of great division at the time of the reformation a movement uh emerged called anabaptists who are uh, the descendants of what we call today Quakers and and Amish and you know yeah. uh, uh, what was I, was I almost said Ammonite I didn't mean to say that uh, 
uh, uh, Mennonite. Uh, Ammonites are different people in the Old Testament. You don't go anywhere near, anywhere near them. Uh, but uh, um, it, this was, I mean, and, and you saw this right away. On the it, it went the other side too, where there was a, a, a revolt against the aristocracy in Germany, uh, in, in as inspiration to uh, claimed inspiration to what Luther and the reformers were claiming. So there, this has been a tension within Protestantism from the beginning, which is to um, to directly link biblical outcomes with civic and societal events to the point that they're almost merged together. And the, 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 the spheres of authority, the family, church, and government are fused. The ultimate example of this, which you saw the, the co-opting of the church in, in Germany in the 1930s is the ultimate example where Lutheran ministers were just wearing the iron cross and the, and the cross of Christ around their exact same necks. Okay. Or to go the other direction, way far the other direction and essentially just you know um uh, live the life of Ralph Waldo Emerson with bible verses and that's there's more to it but I basically just told you that an Anabaptist is an Anabaptist is someone who uh you know wants to live like Ralph Waldo Emerson with bible verses basically um and so this has been a, a tension that has existed all throughout Protestantism um, I would urge you guys, I've, I've done numerous presentations on this. I, I've, people have taken the videos of them and put them on Roman and put them on YouTube. If you go search my name in Romans 13, there is a, um, there, there is a, a longer exegetical, uh, breakout that I do of Romans 13, but I'll, I'll give you the abbreviated version here. Uh, number one, the, someone's words mean what the person who wrote them meant them to mean, not what we mean them to mean. And by the way, this was even debated during the the during the constant or during the uh, the Philadelphia Convention leading up to the Declaration. I mean, you had you had you had states with heavy Anabaptist influence like Pennsylvania, where Quakers were were ascendant, that did not believe that you could revolt against government at all i mean they they were debating this theologically i mean and you see this referenced in things that like wording in the declaration when when jefferson at the end urges god to judge them for the rectitude or of their actions meaning is this pure of motive is this have they rightly divided the word that's what they mean by that that was that was an accommodation there were people that were very there were there were there were plenty of people that were very hesitant even while they found what the king was doing abhorrent have hesitant to go to the next level with this so this has been a, a constant struggle uh, since the day since the reformation itself but um if you want to know what romans 13 looks like look at what the look at the life lived by the man who wrote those words paul and they they mean what he thinks they mean they're his words given to him by the holy spirit and if you look at romans 13 says to give honor to pay taxes to those whom taxes are due Honor to those whom honor is due. Most of the time when we quote Romans 13, we do not quote the fullness of, of, of that chapter and leave the, and we stop short of those lines. But they're very important because what, what, what Paul is doing is he is further um, hermeneutically adjudicating Jesus' teaching, render under Caesar that which is Caesar's, render under God that which is God's. And of course, when Jesus says that, it's in response to being given a coin and whose face was on it. Is there? Yeah, Caesar's. Yeah. And so this is, this is, if Paul is fleshing this out more, all right? He's catechizing it now. What's this mean in the real world? And what it means in the real world is pay taxes to those, who, those whom taxes are due, give honor to those whom honor is due. That's what it means. So Caesar fixes your sidewalks. You pay him taxes? Yeah. Yeah. He's owed those taxes, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Caesar says you have to abandon Christ and bow the knee to me. Should you do that? No. No, it's not an honor See, that Caesar. I get, yeah, it's not an honor that Caesar is due. That's, that's what, what it means. I don't understand. The math seems pretty direct and not particularly complicated. And it this is obvious a thing. And history I get. Mm -hmm. Um but I, I find it I, I, I'm fascinated every time this comes up. I, I'm, I'm genuinely in my own heart and mind trying to connect the dots on why this seems to be such a fixation. And I don't mean that in any pejorative sense. Like, people are genuinely con overwrought by this. As a rule of thumb, you are never permitted to do 
anything for someone else that causes you to violate God's word or God's law. Whether that someone else is your government, whether that someone else is a spouse, whether that someone else is a job, whether that someone else is a son or a daughter, you're, you're, you are never permitted to do that. Ever. We are not our own. We were bought at a high price. We are bond servants of Christ. So we put for him first in all things. Period. And we live in a day and age where you're going to be asked quite frequently to not do that. And directly so. I mean, and isn't the extension of what they're... For, like, when we implore people, even if your kids go to private school, we all live in the... Like, you got to get out to these public school meetings. You just can't let them trans all these kids. See, here's, I, here's, isn't here's, the implication for them, like, I can't do that. It's the government has decided. So this is where, from where you're coming from, ecclesiastically you have an advantage okay though you go though you are and you and and I'm 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 quoting you paraphrasing you when I say this though you are largely surrounded by people and and church leaders and parishioners who do not either acknowledge these advantages or exploit them but ignore them or are ignorant to them you but they these advantages still exist you can you still have these sorts of context via your access to tradition or church history that answers and adjudicates some of these questions for you all right most protestants don't have any of that then they and and in and in place of that there's nothing like the amount of churches that will actually help what's what's the person's name that sent this uh, let me back up here. J.C. Fisher. All right. So the amount of churches, of evangelical churches that someone like J.C. could go to and request the pastor to do a sermon on this in an upcoming Sunday to help them navigate these waters is extremely small. And so you're and, and, and so, you know, you're uh, on your side of the street. There is this vast treasure trove of knowledge that people are willfully choosing to disregard. On our side of this street, there is a vast treasure trove of knowledge that we have willfully chosen to disregard okay, and have put nothing in its place. We have put nothing in its place. Nothing. And so, you know, it, it, we, have, we have nothing historically to go by to, as, a, as a guiding light of, all right, Paul wrote this when, you know, 50, 60 AD. It's 2024. What's it mean now? No Christians wrestled with this between 60 AD and now? What did they do? What did Paul himself do? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. On our side of the street, we have like none of this. None of this context at all. Why? Well, if I preach this context, then, then you know, people would act on it. And I don't want them to act on it. I want them to enjoy their sweater vest and pleated khakis. When businesses used to be just about let's make a profit, take care of our customers, provide livings for people. Yeah, those were the days. Again, man, I was I was watching. I watched last night the uh, 1980 U.S. Olympic team win over the Soviet Union on on YouTube. The actual broadcast, and man, I got to tell you. Even though you know what's coming, those final two minutes, the call by Al Michaels and Ken Dryden, even thinking about it right now, hair in the back, your neck stands up kind of stuff. I mean, but the commercials, dude, again, <laughs> I hate to keep beating this dead horse, but these commercials are just like, I'm successful and I'm not ashamed. And I'm just like, what? Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? <laughs> you know what I mean? That kind of thing. A nation turns its lonely eyes to you. Um, that's what New Founding wants to do. They want to bring back the spirit of the American entrepreneur, make sure it stays free. Now more than ever, the best founders in America are walking away from big, corrupt, woke corporations, and they need help, though. That's maybe where you could come in. 
New founding is investing in these companies through their venture fund. The companies they invest in are defined by a simple question. Does the country we want to live in need the company this person is building? And if you want to help build country, build uh, companies with that framework in mind, you can join them. Venture investing isn't for everyone, but if you're a serious accredited investor who wants to see your more hopeful future for the country, go to newfounding.com backslash venture fund and apply to be an investor today. Newfounding.com backslash venture fund. Again, join their venture fund today at newfounding.com backslash venture fund. All right, let's get back to some Ask Me Anything. Aaron. Let's go lightning round here. We've got how many do we have left here? Let me count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I think eleven more questions right. left. And we'll begin with Al Hustis the third, who asks, is there a conservative pack out there that we could all donate to that would at least primary rhinos in states where one or two would be vulnerable? If not, is there a person like Daniel Horowitz who he could trust to run it and not turn Rhino over time? No, there's not. And yes, you could trust someone like Daniel to run it. You cannot trust donors um, to donate that could bring actual critical mass to it to donate to it, which is why we don't have it. Next, we go to Linda Marshall, who asks, would it be possible for Aaron to do an overtime uh, at least twice a month on smoking and grilling? Maybe record some of his cooking as tutorials and discuss pros and cons of various methods, smokers versus grills, rubs, etc. I think this is a great idea. One, that's less content that I got to come up with, man. All right. And then number two, hey, I think that I think that would be kind of a neat thing. Dude, we're doing a cooking show with Phil Robertson. Cooking with Aaron. Why not smoke your meat with uh, Aaron? Mac- I probably oh, stop. I didn't. Re- I didn't mean to do that. We'd have at least one viewer. I didn't. I didn't. First name Lindsay, last name Graham. I didn't. Oh, meme away, people. Meme away. I, I, can't, I can't say learn how to smoke your. I can't. I can't say meat smoker. I, what did you do, Deborah? <laughs> that oh. was not. That was not intentional. But something about the fine arts. Of meat smokage, okay? I think we just guaranteed that this will never happen. <laughs> That's true. What do you call that? There's cooking with the Robertsons, but do you want to do smoke your meat with Aaron? Maybe not. Probably not. Aaron smokes your meat? Probably not. Did ribs this weekend. Oh, those are good. Were they good? Oh, I've man. never been a big rib guy, but when you get to- It, does, it is a little bit more laborious, I it understand. Is, but when you start talking about brisket, man, that is my jam. I love freaking brisket. Yeah. And burnt ends. I love burnt ends. See, my brisket was so juicy, I didn't even have any ends to burn. It was all juicy. That's, Ready a, to move that's on? a good problem to have. I am, yeah. Uh, next, we go to Bill Caldera. Is IVF complicated, or is the pro-life movement just phony? Well, I think the, qu- the answer to that is both. Uh, yes. Um, and I, 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 think so, I think there's been... We spent 40 years trying to overturn Roe v. Wade without actually asking the argument, begging the argument that would get Roe v. Wade overturned. So this again gets into the whole thing with catechesis I was just talking about with Todd. All right. Most, most people today, uh, let me, let me actually specify that all the more. Most of our people today, if they're, if they're not, corrupted by access-based politics, which unfortunately is too many people. But if they're not, and they're sincere, um, then it's not, you know, because of access. You know, the whole big baby phenomenon our, our, our president, Gaston Mooney, has described to us about his time on Capitol Hill. It, it, it comes down to their view. Their, it, it comes down to worldview. You can't escape your worldview. Most people nowadays are what is called a legal positivist. Now, there's a, there's a lot of definitions to this, but the simplest one is whatever entity is recognized as, as the legit source and enforcement of the law gets to determine what the law is. Now, if, if, if you believe in a transcendent God outside of time and space who's immovable, incontrovertible, See where I'm going with this? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you believe your rights are unalienable and preexistent in nature. How would you do in an environment where the law is determined by whoever the people the, the, it recognizes is the, is, is, the, is the rightful source of it? 
You'd have some issues. There would be some complications yes. in said relationship. You might even have, you know, a major publication in a major network last week say that, I can't believe these people think their rights come from God and not from Congress. Right? You might even yes. have moments like that. But before you scoff at them, that is not far off of what, even though they wouldn't say this as a premise, when you apply what people on the right, like the federal, Federalist Society, believe, it's the same thing. And I, go, I know you guys like to go back to the interview we did with that Noah Rothman from, mm -hmm. the, from these groups several years ago. And I just asked him, what, what, could you, what could a court possibly say is the law, Noah, that you would tell us to disobey? And he couldn't answer, remember? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, and he seemed proud of it. Yeah. Like that was wisdom. Correct. To, like we attacked Joe Biden last week for defying the court. Right. When does, where, where, where does the court get to make laws? I mean, didn't, didn't we spend 50 years in, you know, acting as if Roe v. Wade should never have been law? And wasn't, wasn't, wasn't that what impressed us about the Dobbs decision is didn't Alito and Thomas write, this is bad law. It's not even a law. Courts can't do what they tried to do. That was the whole point. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I, so the people who represent us won't frame, won't frame their premise that way. But when you look at the way they live, because Jesus said also, by their premise, you will know them. Is that what he said? No. no he said, by their fruit, you will know them. Now, yes. now listen, a, a bad premise is going to often get, a, most of the time, bad fruit or bad seed leads to bad fruit, right? Or bad fruit leads to, bad tree leads to bad fruit. But the way that they actually practice what they preach is not any different than what Politico and MSNBC was writing last week. No, your rights don't come from God. Well, no, I mean, the courts have said that's not a God-given right anymore, so it's gone. So what do we do? I guess, I mean, I guess it's gone. I mean, it wasn't an label after all. So a lot of this is worldview-oriented. Again, we are, we are the, we are the era, we're in the era now, you know, we just had, what, the third anniversary of Russia's passing last week, I think it was? The, the stuff guys like Rush were telling you 20, 30 years ago, boy, if we keep letting them, if we keep letting them, accepting this premise, this is where this will ultimately go. And we'd listen and get all worked up for a few hours and then go back to our Pleasant Valley Sundays. Ha 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 ha. Right. Well, huh. that day's arrived. We're here now. All the premises we let them instill, we're now under the thumb of. We're living in those times they warned us about. Those times are now. And you can see we don't have much of an answer. And frankly, in many cases, haven't even contemplated them. Next question. Next, we go to Dennis McCullough, who asks, would you rather spread the gospel in front of a joint session of Congress being introduced by Lindsey Graham or at Lakewood Church in Houston being introduced by <laughs> Joel Osteen? The latter. The latter, for sure. Next. Not even Not even debatable, the latter. That's the largest ministerial platform other than the papacy on planet Earth is what Joel Osteen has, the latter. Next, we go to Anthony Fava, who says, are men really to blame for not getting married when two thirds of unmarried women vote Democrat, thereby making them unmarriageable? Yes. Yeah. Because um, the reason why those women are voting that way. Their dads sucked or their dads weren't around. Their dads didn't lead. Their male Christian teachers uh, taught them evolution in schools anyway, because they had to keep tenure in their jobs. We're not, we're not out running male accountability on this show. You'll have to go somewhere else for that. Won't happen here. And if you think, if you think I've got no problem holding females accountable, go talk to Anastasia and Zoe and see what they think. But ultimately the culture the creation runs on headship. We are the head. We are. Now, what does headship mean? It doesn't mean the most power. It means the most responsibility. So, yeah, the men failed, which opened the women up to adopt and accept these ideologies. By and large, it can happen. I mean, I, you know, I know good Christian homes. The parents were great. I mean, the kids are sinners, and, 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 a, and a daughter ran off to college and embraced third-wave feminism. But by and large, which kid is more likely to embrace, which girl is more likely to embrace third-wave feminism? One who spent 19 years in government schools with a dad who wasn't there, 
or one who didn't with a dad who was? Which one's more likely to embrace third wave feminism? Former. The former. And is it even close? No, not no, really. No. When, now, when we're sinners, are there exceptions to of rules? Course. Of course. But as a general rule, if we're, if we're just playing the odds here, right? Yes. Well, Han Solo, don't tell me the odds. If we're just playing the odds here, what are the odds? The kid that, that didn't get uh, indoctrinated by Caesar and dad was at home and a good dad, or the kid that did get indoctrinated by Caesar and dad wasn't home. Who's more likely to think, you know, I think Nicki Minaj is a prophetess. Who's more likely to think that, do you think? The one whose dad wasn't there and who Caesar educated. So you, we will not escape male accountability on this show. Won't happen. And what you're telling me then is if you're not married, there's still one third of women out there that you could go find a wife to. So get moving. Next, we go to Ash Mason. What conference will Florida State be in two seasons from now? What a transition. <laughs> what, a, what a segue. Only show on the face of the planet. <laughs> I know why you put this in here, too. I know why you did. I, I'm, dude, I feel you. Yeah. I get, I get it. I get it. Um, it, it, it. A conference not named the ACC. What we don't know is... I don't think the SEC wants to take Florida State, but I also don't think the SEC wants Florida State to go to the Big Ten so that the Big Ten has a footprint there. So they'll, they'll hash it out, but it won't be a conference called the ACC. Next question. Next, we go to Stephanie Hayes, who asks, what court do you trust to do the Nuremberg-type trials? One that I would like to hand pick. Fair? <laughs> I will hand pick this one, that one. That's my answer when I get the hand pick. Matthew Spurko says, would you agree that today's leftists, Marxists, are very similar to the Pharisees and Sadducees in the Gospels? No. Um, I think they're very similar to the Sadducees, but I think the Republicans are actually very similar to the Pharisees. In that they claim to represent a legacy of righteousness and orthodoxy, and some of them still do. And some of them recognize truth incarnate when it arrived. But most of them really resented the idea that they were, uh, they viewed themselves as, as, well, we're better than the Sadducees. We're the better people. You know, we're the more godly people. How dare you ask us to do more, to be better, and resented it. That sounds like a very Republican Party mindset to me. James Paul asks, I know if no candidate receives 270 electoral votes, it goes to the House. How likely do you think the scenario is, and what do you think the House would do? I think it's, <laughs> I, I, I have a hard time believing after we count ballots till Christmas Eve yep. that they're going to come back with, guys, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. I have a hard, I have a hard time. Even, even if Biden's behind, like Philadelphia County is going to stop counting when it's tied in the electoral college, they're not going to, we're not going to get one more drop, one more bag dropped off. And Maricopa County is not going to find one more bag. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. That's a great troll. And if it's not a troll, I'm going to, I'm going to receive it as one for everybody's sake. All right. Next up, we go to Mike Hansen. Do you think the U.S. is the Babylon of Revelation? If so, would the open border and lack of tracking of military age illegals allow for Jeremiah 51, 14 to come true here, which is the Lord of hosts has sworn by himself. Surely I will fill you with men as many as locusts and they shall raise the shout of victory over you. I don't. Uh, I do think, though, that the United States is maybe the second coming of the book of Judges. All right, next up, and finally this, Paul D. Wilder asks this, do you think that this is you or not? First John 2, 15 through 17, which is, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world. The desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Do you think that is you or not? Paul wants to know. I think that that is, if you're a believer, that is all of our yes. ultimate goals. But he who has begun a good work with you in you is faithful until its completion. And the work that is being done in me is not yet completed. And the work that's being done in you is not yet completed, Paul. And we know that because you're still here. So, but I think that, that that is the ultimate goal. Sure. 
Absolutely. That's the finishing touch. But none of us are a finished product yet. That's it. All right. Any final thoughts? Going back to the IVF conversation, it really isn't actually that that complicated. Uh, unfortunately, like most conversations, serious conversations, right-wing America was not ready to have it. But tell me what I'm describing here. Okay, because this is usually a defense. Um, this is the motivation, the intent, uh, the in, uh, intent of a practice is inherently pro-human. That's the intent. But the collateral damage created along the way calls into question the aim of that intent. What am I describing here? Gain of function or IVF? You see what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. So it's it, if that embryo is indeed a human, and I mean, the United States is the Wild West, as I understand, of IVF, where you're creating, you know, maybe a dozen embryos at a time, whereas New Zealand and Australia, they, they you know, kind of confine it to two, I think, at a time. It, it's a conversation you need, to, you need to grapple with. I'll say that. Well, we're going to grapple with the conversation we have with Catherine Engelbrecht in the overtime for Blaze TV subscribers. For the rest of you, we will see you tomorrow. Until then, Romans 828.